Welcome to episode 161 of the Bandhive Podcast. It is time for another episode of the Bandhive Podcast. My name is James Cross, and I help independent artists tour smart. I'm here with Matt Hose of Alive in Barcelona. How are you doing today, Matt? James, I am doing fantastic. It is a beautiful day in Colorado. How are things over there on the East Coast? I'm glad to hear that. And things are gray, but also great because we have a very special guest from further east than me, Stephen Pell of Iconic over in the UK. How are you doing today, Stephen? I'm doing great, thanks. Yeah, it's absolutely freezing cold here today as well and gray. You've sent the British weather over to Vermont. I think that's what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but anyway, thank you so much for joining us. This is an episode that I've wanted to do for a long time, but I didn't have the right person to do it. And then you reached out a couple of weeks ago and said, hey, can I come on the show and talk about finance for artists? So immediately I said, yes, let's do it. And here we are. So thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. I appreciate being invited on. I'm just excited that someone else wants to talk about finances in, uh, in music. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, of course. And I should preface this by, for all the artists who listen to this show, you know this show is all about business. And typically, we try to keep it around the more exciting sides of businesses. And I'm not saying accounting isn't exciting. But before anyone goes and tunes out and says, you don't need to learn about accounting and finance, just stick around. This is going to be like 45 minutes probably after the edit. And it's going to be so worth it because you're going to understand how to use your money more effectively and put it towards good things in your band. So to start off, Stephen, would you mind just telling us a little bit about what your background, what got you into accounting, and what specifically inspired you to get into the music side of accounting? Because that's a very niche area to be in. Yeah, sure. So I'm CEO and co-founder of a, an accounting business called Iconic. We support iconic creators in the music and entertainment industry. And sort of around that, I've written a couple of books that help musicians and creators remove the anxiety from their finances. It helps them to build better businesses. But believe it or not, I used to be in a punk rock band in my teens, which has kind of <laughs> driven me in this sort of direction. In fact, I think from about 15 years old, I was utterly convinced that I'd be a rock star. There was nothing that was going to get in my way. And I did that for five or six years. We never went outside of the UK. But when I went to university or college in the UK, that's where I started getting a bit serious with it. And I think we played about 100 100 plus shows in a year. We toured pretty hard and we knocked on loads of doors, but we never really made it. We had a little bit of interest from labels and booking agents and things like that. We didn't have a manager. I was doing the management side of things. I was doing the business management side of things. I was the one that was sort of negotiating the, you know, the ticket sales, the bar splits and all of that fun stuff that you get to do. But I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I think that's where I got the passion from it. And I read every single book I could get my hands on. I just needed knowledge, but I felt that there was always like this glass ceiling. And I didn't feel like I had enough information, particularly around like the finance side of things. And also I didn't have a strong enough network at the time to get to where I needed to get to. I made tons of mistakes, but that's, that was kind of my journey. Fast forward five or six years, the band it ever to be broke up, sort of personal reasons between band members as things like that quite often happen. And so I kind of need to get a job. I just love business and I thought, mm, accounting, that's something that I can perhaps do. And my first thought was when I was getting into doing my training that, you know, one day, I mean, this works pretty boring, but I could find my way back into the industry. And so that's kind of where I fell. I worked for a couple of years in sort of a general boring accountancy practice, then circled back <laughs> round to working for sort of like, we call it like a West End accountancy firm in the UK, which looked after a lot of big artists, film directors, actors, and I got my first real taste of the music industry from a very different perspective, from a sort of a, a hit artist, a superstar artist perspective. And that's where I got my first taste of this service, which is big in the US, but not in the UK. And it's something called business management. Five years on, we're a team of about 20 people working across the UK and the US, specializing obviously in the music industry and music artists. But I work not just with music artists, I work with music producers, songwriters, mix engineers, most of them all at the top of their game. But having said that, when I first started Iconic six years ago, I was working with people just starting out. Those independent artists that had, had the big dream, big ambition. I started with no clients. So we, I kind of have grown with a lot of these people and, and some of which are doing very well now and have sold names. So that's what it's all about for me. It's that journey and being part of the industry and doing my little bit to help people to keep on inspiring me. 
with the music that they make. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I was going to mention this later in the interview because a lot of artists just say, hey, we want a manager. And they don't realize that there are different types of manager. And you already threw out one of the terms there, business manager. So you have personal managers and business managers. Can you kind of give a little breakdown of what the difference is between the two and why an artist might need both? Sure. So I'll add another one in there. So from my perspective, there's the accountant or CPA, there's a business manager, and then there's your personal manager. In your sort of financial ecosystem of advisors, they're your three. The accountant or CPA might be the person that does the high level tax advice. You might, they might file your taxes once a year and help with once a year advisory bits and pieces, tax planning potentially. Business manager is a much more all encompassing role. It's really someone that looks after your day to day finances, someone that's overseeing your bank accounts, managing your cash flow, chasing down money, checking your royalty statements, paying bills, setting budgets, reconciling tours, chasing an agency statement, and really being almost like the quarterback, the person that's sort of pulling all the strings when you're a finance team and your wider business team. Then you've got your personal manager who really is more in charge of the strategic direction of your career. They'll also be more closely aligned to day-to-day operational issues. And from our perspective, the personal manager will be out there finding the deals, negotiating the deals, and then they will come to us and then we basically make them happen, making sure that there's contracts being invoiced, money's collected, and that ecosystem is very, very important. So having a, a very good relationship between manager and business manager is, is absolutely essential because they will need to work in tandem. Going back to the accountant and the business manager, we actually have the accountant CPA role wrapped within what we do. So that's quite common as well. So we would file taxes and do tax planning and that high level strategic wealth management stuff as well. But quite often, particularly in the past, there would be an accountant, business manager, and, and personal manager managing that sort of financial ecosystem. That's all absolutely fantastic. You dissected those perfectly. I think it's one of the most important things to realize. You said something there. It's just like maintaining the, the overall status quo in the entire ecosystem being such an important thing. I can't harp on that hard enough that money talks. When bills are not being paid on time and when managers are not being paid on time and when band members aren't getting per diems on time, and you know, that that's when animosity starts to rise, when friction happens. And so like, you know, having somebody like you on the band's team, it's just absolutely integral to succeeding in the music industry because people are only going to work so hard when they're not being paid on time. And that's every industry. So it's absolutely paramount to make sure that all of these aces are in their places. I love the way you said that. For sure. And I would, I would just sort of add into that, that when I'm talking to my clients for the first time about a manager and business manager, those roles can be quite confusing. And sometimes where that line gets drawn is very confusing, even for the manager, because business managers and personal managers, they, they can operate in different ways. Some managers like to be in control of the finances a bit more. And some business managers have to pick up the slack from personal managers. They have their organizational shortfalls, for example. We sort of see the business manager, there's that foundation, that structure, the defense in the sort of the operations of the artist, and that then frees up the management team to be on the offensive, to go and earn the money, go and get the deals. And those teams need to work or find a way of working very closely together in tandem to create a successful relationship. The way I'm picturing it from what you describe is the personal manager is kind of the big picture ideas person. They say, yeah, this is what we're going to do. And then it's up to you, the business manager, to get that execution in place. You're doing the nitty gritty of making sure that, hey, we're not getting screwed over on this contract. We're going to actually get the money that we're owed. We do sometimes get involved in helping to negotiate on the record deals and the merch deals and things like that, because there are some elements to the contracts that we can be quite commercially leading with some of the the stuff that we do and the advice that we give. So it's not just about us creating that organization and and making sure that the finances are are running smoothly. There's also a lot of value added in our approach to, oh, well, hang on. We see a lot of other artists with a royalty rate that's 2% higher. Why aren't you going for that deal? Or actually, why aren't you getting paid every quarter like you have offered this artist? There's things that we can sort of bring because as business managers, we tend to work with more artists. A manager tends to have fewer artists on their roster just because there's more work day to day. Whereas a business manager, we get to see a lot more deals. That means that we get to offer quite a lot more value in that respect to see what other people are doing across the board. That's a great point to be able to have that 10,000 foot view and say, 
you think that's a great deal. That's not that great of a deal. Now, to bring this down to a much lower level, the bands you mentioned that you used to work with when you were starting out, a lot of artists, when they're launching their careers, are not focused on money at all. They're focused on writing music and spending way too much on gear. <laughs> what advice would you share to artists in that position so they can build up a sustainable career and avoid the common pitfall of spending way more money than they have on gear? It's a great question. I would say, first of all, it's really important that you do focus on your art and getting that right, because without that, there's no business, there's, there's nothing else. So it is an important focus, otherwise there's no longevity. But what I would say that if you're starting to think about gear and the word expensive, that means that you're conceptualizing how much things cost. And when you start to do that, you're actually starting to become quite financially focused, whether you think you are or not. So if you think, oh, I've got to buy this expensive gear or what do I prioritize? What do I buy? You're already thinking a bit like an accountant. You're already getting your head in the right space, getting the mindset right for that. But right off the bat, what I can say is number one, the biggest issue that I saw for the bands that we kind of started working with was too much debt early on. They were maxing credit cards to buy equipment. They might be taking out loans, personal loans. They were putting perhaps too much of their own money into the projects without thinking about sort of the long-term effects of them keeping on going. A little bit of debt that's manageable is fine. But you've got to be realistic because that's something that could really catch up with you. The other thing that I kind of saw quite a lot of a common pitfall was not budgeting. Not looking ahead and sort of trying to plot out what the cost might be over the course of a 12-month period or six-month period. Or even looking at a particular project or thinking in terms of start and end of projects. So, for example, the way that I, I look at everything in music is everything's a project. Everything is a start and an end. You have a period where you're touring. There's a planning phase for that. And then there's a sort of a invitation phase. And then there's a sort of wrap up that has milestones. The same with sort of recording as well. So thinking in terms of budgets for projects is something that I would start doing even early on and getting into a good habit of doing. It's not obviously the bill or an end all, but the other sort of pitfall is not knowing what I call your expense runway is. So of the money that you have, how long is it going to last? How many months have you got operating in this way before you need to earn, earn some more or find some other revenue streams? I would also say early on, not keeping on top of taxes. It might be that there's nothing to pay or there's nothing to owe in those early days, but you still will have an obligation in most cases to file. And if you bury your head in the sand with those, it might not cause a problem right away. But in five years time, when the tax authorities catch up with you, and particularly if you then become high profile in your career, then that's the kind of noise that you just do not need or want to have to deal with. So just being compliant little and often and just taking care of this sort of the tax administration things is something that we've had to tidy up more times than not when it comes to taking on clients. And that's even the case that right at the early stages of, of an artist's career, you still have a business, whether you're making money or not. In most cases, if you're incurring expenses with the intention to make money, that's a business. You need to have a handle on that and make sure that you're doing what everyone else has to do in this world, which is be compliant and file taxes. Yeah. One thing I would like to add to that, one of my friends in the ongoing concept said it perfectly years and years and years ago when they were starting touring and he was focusing on taxes and everybody's saying, oh, you don't make enough money to file taxes. He says, yeah, but I want to do this my whole life and I want to buy a house someday. And that simple fact, you know, is just something that so many people overlook. If you want to get a loan from a bank, then you need history. If you need history, that means that you need to be able to prove your taxable income. Otherwise, no lender is going to come in and loan you money. Just like with a record label, if you're not doing the work already, no record label is going to put their name on you. If your finances aren't in order, no bank is going to come in and fund you. If you want to do this for 20 years and you don't want the tax authorities showing up on your doorstep in 20 years to knock and to take your home away, you need to be consistently paying your taxes and you do that by documenting them well. It can be a headache because it's something that you don't do super consistently, which I think is why a lot of business people will, will do their taxes quarterly. It's like it's a lot easier to do things once every three months than it is to do it once every 12 months. Like you were saying with the CPA earlier, like I think that's one of the most useful tools that you can have in your Rolodex is somebody who understands this is a full stop situation. If you don't pay your taxes, you're out there, you're making money. You finally get that call to come play, you know, a five, six figure show or something like that, or you're playing on this big tour and you're going to make a ton of money. 
that's going to attract a lot of attention from people who are like, hey, where, where's my cut? Why is it that you're not complying in uh, areas X, Y, Z? Why is it that you're now buying a $100,000 house and you know we have no tax history on you? Those are definite ways to put a real damper on your music career. Keeping those ducks in a row is just so, so integral. Yeah, for sure. And it, in my book, I talk about a story about this DJ that I work with, changed all the names for privacy, but he hadn't filed for two or three years and the tax authorities caught up with him eventually. And we had to deal with the situation. The tax authorities are number one creditor. You have to pay them. There's no way around it. But what that meant is that the cash went to the IRS, which meant that he couldn't fund a tour or, or fund the production. So his career was put on hold for a mistake that he made two or three years ago. And then he had the sort of COVID pandemic after that. His career is pretty much ruined from you know that mistake plus the pandemic and he can't get back on his feet. And obviously with the music, you need that momentum. You need to ride those waves. Anything that will get in your way, you have to remove those obstacles and you have to think ahead. And tack is just one of those monsters that you have to slay really early and just be on top of. Absolutely. And we discussed in the uh, planning for this interview that we weren't really going to get into the minutia of tax laws in the US versus the UK or anything like that. But one thing that I want to point out on, and you can correct me on this, Stephen, but a lot of people seem to have the idea that if you get an independent contractor payment in the US, a 1099 payment, you don't have to report it if it's under $600. But really, from my understanding, is that the person paying you doesn't have to report it but the person receiving the funds still has to report that income. Is that correct? I'm not a U.S. tax specialist. So I don't want to give any wrong advice here. I'll let you uh, speak to my, my U.S. tax advisor on that one. But on the 1099 payments, you know, if you're not reporting the income, then what about all well, the expense? You can't write off your expenses. And there might be some planning opportunities when writing off your expenses and deductions, particularly if you're feeling your income is not particularly high and you write off expenses to claim the loss. Losses can then be offset, carried forward, which will help in future years, you might be a bit just missing out on opportunities. So I think going back to the point of just making sure that you're following the rules, whatever they are in your jurisdiction, that's a good example of one where there could be unintended consequences. And the other thing I say in my book is what we call in the UK, avoid the pub talk. When you're on the road, you're going to say, oh, my accountant says this, my CPA says this, I didn't pay any tax this year because my CPA is so great. Whereas my response to that is if you're not paying any tax, you're either not making any money, which isn't great, or you're cheating, which isn't great. So <laughs> I try and get my clients just to reframe tax is everyone has to pay it. There's certain things we can do to mitigate it, but comparing them year on year, it's like a leading performance indicator. The more tax you pay, the better you're doing. Great. Celebrate. As long as you've got a strategy in place for managing it. Said so every quarter, like with our clients, we have a system for calculating taxes every month. One of the things that we talk about in the book is having a, a tax pocket account or a bank account. You make sure that's fully funded every month or every quarter. So it's very clear what you owe. And I even say, set up a bank account, then rename it tax authorities money, do not touch something just to sort of make sure that you're kind of reframing it in, in a way that that's not your money, because at the end of the day, that money is, is owed to the tax authorities at, at some point. And you might as well take it out of your bank account, avoid the confusion and not feel so bad at the end of the year when you have to pay it over although inevitably you will be. It's just creating that mindset shift. There's something that we can't get away from. Let's put a few hacks in place to make sure that we're managing it well and then celebrating the fact when we're doing well because tax the percentage of profits. The higher your profits, the more tax you're going to pay. Exactly. You've mentioned budgeting a few times. I like the idea of having a separate account for the funds that you owe to the tax agency in whatever area you're in, whatever jurisdiction. Do you have a preferred budgeting app that you would recommend artists should use? Yes, yeah, a really good question. So I still quite like a Google Doc or an Excel for budgeting and projections and things like that, just because it's more flexible and you can do more with it. Quite a lot of banks these days have, you can create the pocket accounts and things like that. And, you know, they can automatically transfer money through those. The way that I would conceptualize budgeting is look at your income past year and then within each of the categories, what percentage of those costs relate to income. And then, you know, every dollar that comes in, you can say, oh, okay, well, 30% of it relates to, to marketing spend or 10% of my income last year was on software or consumables. And then you can kind of separate out these accounts within your account set 
And then you have your, your pockets, your budgets. So every time, you know, you receive money because it's lumpy throughout the year, you start building your funds within each of your bank accounts. And that creates the budget that you have to spend. It just makes it easier to visualize. But yeah, going back to your question about budgeting software per se, I don't have any sort of recommendations from my perspective. I like something that's really flexible, like a Google Sheets or, or something that's easy to roll forwards and use formulas in and things like that. But yeah, that's kind of would be my approach. Well, Google Sheets is an app. I would say that counts. <laughs> <laughs> It's free. That's probably going to be the most accessible for a lot of artists who are still pinching pennies because they're not at the level where they can drop 10 to $30 a month, depending on the app. There's already enough friction. So just like having something that everybody can all look at at the same time, just the same as having a one sheet inside of your tour bus. Like when we all wake up and we can say like, oh yeah, like we're in this city, you know, load ins at this time, you know, we got a back line, we got to do this. Like when you have five different people on the bus and then you have financial advisors somewhere else, you met, you have a band manager somewhere else, you have a PR company somewhere else, you have a booking agent somewhere else. And like all of these nodes essentially are all culminating in order to make a product and to make you function as a business. It's very, very important to have something that's just like easily shareable that everybody can revert back to and say like, oh yeah, right here on the Google sheet, it says X amount of dollars is owed. And how long is our drive tomorrow? Oh, our drive tomorrow is 215 miles. So we need to make sure we have at least, you know, $50 worth of gas in the, you know, in the tank or whatever. And just having kind of all of those assets at your disposal is just, that's wonderful. The path to the most success is the path with the least friction. I think that's a really good point. And just to add to that as well, a collaboration is really, really important. Financial transparency is really, really important, but even more so for bands. I work with a lot of bands and it can be a point of contention managing the finances. And my sort of advice to bands starting out or starting to make some money is to nominate someone in the band who is the finance person, the internal finance manager within the band, obviously they don't have to be an accountant. They just have to be one that's willing to take responsibility because I can guarantee you no one else will. And you need to make sure that there's someone that's going to be talking to the accountant, making sure that records are kept, keeping things on track and reporting back to the rest of the band. So making sure that that role is clear. And then obviously using a, a collaborative tool like Google Sheets to share that information regularly is also really important. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Like you say, no one's going to step up and do it if no one is given that role. Years ago, man, I can't remember if it was you or Aaron on the show, but we did an episode about dividing up roles and responsibilities. Episode 14, you can take a listen to that at bandhive.rocks slash 14. That's the number 14. I don't think we specifically mentioned a finance person there. We did kind of divvy it up into you have a manager, you have a social media person, you have a gear person. But, you know, a finance person, that is the missing piece. We should have had that in that episode. So I'm really glad you brought that up, Stephen. And when you look at the most important pieces of advice that you give to your icon clients, your bigger clients, what pieces of advice that they execute do you wish smaller independent artists would uh, listen to and heed your advice on as well? Executing the basics really well, even though we work with icons, household names, people that everyone knows, we still preach the foundations, the fundamentals of getting your taxes right, making sure you're not paying yourself too much, but just enough to make sure that you are thriving and that you're engaged and making sure that you build yourself a really good financial safety net and have a strategy for paying yourself out when times are good, when there's a windfall. For me, they're the three core business management areas that we would focus on, whereas other business managers might think about, oh, okay, well, we can set up offshore companies and find ways not to pay tax and all of those kind of things. We're just focused on real good business management. If I was to sort of give some advice on what our iconic clients would say they wish they'd done better, it would be they wish that they had a handle on their taxes better. You know, all of their money would be in sort of one bank account and they'd have to sort of figure out what they owe and the taxes would always be a shock. If taxes are a shock and they don't really know how much to pay themselves and they worry that they haven't got enough in savings to see out something like a pandemic because so it was a good test of how good our business management strategies were over the years it creates anxieties it creates a serious amount of pain that anxiety then can have an impact on the creative process we had a lot of clients that shut down you know we saw it in the pandemic it was a great example of how people react under stress and under pressures some people sort of 
that once were prolific creators did nothing two years, whereas others sort of came out of the creative shells and were brilliant with it. But I think having a financial stressor of anxiety around taxes, just not knowing or understanding where they sit with the tax authorities or, or what of their money needs to be paid over or how much they owe or worried that they might have an audit or an inspection can create a lot of pain. And also it's that aspirational thing, like, although it's a, a passion and, and a business, there's also, for, particularly for our clients, going from a sort of independent artist to an icon, it's a journey of, in many ways, social elevation. You want to buy a house, you want to then buy a bigger house or buy a private jet, or I don't know what it might be, you know, when you get to that stage. And part of that is important and knowing how much you can afford to pay yourself without running your business into the ground. I mean, we've all heard the horror stories of famous artists filing for bankruptcy. I can think of just a couple off my head at the moment in the US that have just done or something similar. So it's making sure all those parts are carefully managed, this expectation set right from the start. And we try and be very conservative in our outlook and try and play down things and always try and think of worst case scenarios. And that's why we have a mechanism for when things do go well, that we can respond to that and, and pay out and it'd be a pleasant surprise. But it's that just feeling in control, being able to sleep at night, which is really hard to do. I mean, I'm a business owner myself. It's not so different from when I was in the band worrying about finances and how we were trying to get in the studio and on the road as it is to running Iconic as a business. It's all the same emotions. It's all the same anxieties, all the same fears. Can you pay people? Am I good enough? It can be a real weight on, on your shoulder. What I'm trying to do with Iconic and also with, with the book is to create a set of principles that just put everything on autopilot and that can remove some of that anxiety and create a bit of security and certainty. Nothing is ever predictable. Things will jump out, but there's things that you can do in life. I think loads of stuff that you talked about on the podcast that I've listened to before are sort of, it's about creating that structure and that methodology and that foundation, which enables you to put things on autopilot, to free up that mental space, to be creative and, and to do what artists are great at. The world needs more artists to be creative, just simplifying things and, and having a, a the strong financial foundation will do that. I really love what you said about uncertainty, especially, you know, that's the big fear that hinders people. Just the concept of walking through like a dark field. Are you going to feel more comfortable if you have a light or if you don't? I think it was uh, Eisenhower that said planning is invaluable, but the plan is often useless or something to that effect. Even if you get down to the nitty gritty, some figures have to change or gear breaks down in the middle of a tour and you have these unexpected financial expenses and hindrances, really. The fact that you've taken a little bit of time, you've worked together, everybody, both near and far, all have a rough picture of what's going on. It makes it a lot easier for you to navigate those waters of uncertainty when me as an artist has someone like you as a financial planner and being like, oh yeah, well, that's okay. Because we had this account that was already set up that says, oh, when gear breaks down on tour, and now we can pull some funds out of that. So we don't have to worry about pulling funds from our gas budget or from our tax budget or things of that nature. When you sit down and you make a plan and just having everybody all in on that conversation, that is where the most work gets done. And even if a lot of those things end up getting thrown to the curb, everybody's head is already in the right space. When the boat does start to rock, everybody knows to grab an oar rather than saying, what do we do? What do we do? You know, does the ship capsize? Do we all die? Are we going to eat tomorrow? C you know, can we have gas? Do we need to cancel the tour? It's like in all these just completely irrational thoughts like flood you. And it's like, oh no, like we've already planned for this. Was that plan accurate? No, we couldn't have planned for going through four wheel bearings in one tour because it turns out the rotor was actually the problem and not the wheel bearing. Well, yeah, that's true. But we did expect to at least have to like change two tires and that didn't happen so we still have a little bit of surplus that we can apply to these other areas those waters of uncertainty that really is just like so much of the crippling aspect of the music industry and that fear of the uncertain and the pandemic comes in and like some people shine some people see that chaos and say this is our opportunity i'm going to record you know a whole album during this time that we have down then we see other people that it's like the, the sheer depression of everything going on in the world caused me to buckle under the pressure. And then all of a sudden this band that was consistently like streaming really, really well, all of a sudden missed a monthly release. And then that's the slow degradation of their career. I love what you said about that, Stephen. I think that's right nail on the head. Yeah, just to add to that, Stephen, you know, we want to talk about your book. I have one last question before you get there. 
you mentioned, Stephen, paying yourself too much or not paying yourself enough. If you were to look at an artist, is there a percent range that you would give as an acceptable recommended profit margin that they should aim for? Very good question. So in my book, I talk about what's called a minimum viable lifestyle budget. And so that's something that you need to sort of figure out your lifestyle costs, go through your bank savings line by line, figure out what you need to live a good life, to exist, to function. Massive hierarchy of needs. You need to create yourself a foundation to be able to build a, a platform. And so that's for you personally. You need to put your own life jacket on first. But what is the very minimum amount that you can survive off? And set that as your sort of your minimum salary. So you need your band or you need your music business to earn at least that to get off the ground before you can start thinking about it full time. So that's kind of like the first thing. If you're starting on the next phase in the book, I talk about the salary cap approach. Everyone in the US knows salary cap because it's big in sports. In the US, it's mostly to sort of create parity amongst teams. Whereas in the UK, the salary cap method is used to make sure that the clubs don't go out of business. It sets a percentage of their revenue as a maximum that they're allowed to pay in salaries. And so I borrowed that concept. And this is what we use with Iconic when we're looking at how much you should be paying out to band members or as a percentage of your revenue. And so what we do is we walk through the numbers with them. We start with the income, the costs and taxes and make sure that we've got your, your market rate and salary in there. And then we have a little formula that works out what your salary cap is. And that gives you a range with how much your business can afford to pay you without going bust, basically. What we also recommend is that you build up a reserve of three months of your salary cap in the bank as well, because earnings, are, as you said, are unpredictable and can be lumpy. You've got to have three months of salary in, in the bank so that you can keep going because the worst anxieties you're going to have as someone in a band is when I come back off tour, am I going to be able to feed myself? Have I got enough money to pay my rent? And it's a real problem. But if you know that you've got three months coming back off tour, you know, you can get back, regroup, plan, go again. Going back to ask your question, what percentage of your income, it depends on your business, depends on your business costs, depends on your revenue, because obviously if you're turning over a million, 10% of that is going to be a much bigger number than, you know, 10% of 10 grand. So it's looking at the numbers in, in the context of, of what you can afford, but it's a really good point and you can't overspend. So the point is that there's a cap on what you can be paying out. So overpaying yourself is as much of an issue for the independent artists as not paying yourself enough. And it's really important to get that balance because if you don't pay yourself what you should be worth, then that is a very quick way to lose motivation. Band members will start peeling away. They will start having families. They will start having other commitments. They will start needing to find other ways to make money. So on top of sorting out your taxes, that's number two in your priority list and working through how you set that and understand what that number is. And from a strategic perspective, understanding what your revenue target then needs to be, because then you can go to a manager and say, look, we played the numbers. We know that we need to make this amount of money. Mr. Manager, you need to go and put in some deals to help us with this. Or as a band, we need to think of some commercial strategies that will help us get to this point so we can carry on doing what we're doing and thriving. I love that answer. It's way more complex than I was hoping, but it makes total sense. And I'm looking forward to seeing some artists in our community implement that because you're absolutely right. An artist who's making 10000 a year isn't going to have the same capabilities to pay themselves out as an artist who's making millions a year. That's such a wild difference in the landscape. So I'm really glad you explained it that way. And it also makes me really excited to read your book. It came out last week as of the time of this recording. But by the time that this episode drops, which is going to be December 27th, I'll hopefully have finished it by then. And everyone who is listening, I'll put it in a note in the show notes of uh, what I thought of the book. But to get to the point, it's titled Dream Like an Artist, Think Like an Accountant. And in the U.S., you can get it on Amazon. It's on Kindle as of right now at the time of recording for 99 cents, or you can get the physical copy for about, I think, $16. But Stephen, please tell us more about the book. I can tell people where to get it, but you're the expert on the book because you wrote it. A lot of it touches on what we've talked about today, and it really dives into those three areas of an easy way to manage your taxes and the salary cap solution, a way to set that up. So I'd introduce at the start of, of each of the sections, a story, and it's actually a real life story with me, with a client and then an issue that sort of forced them in having to make a decision to do something about their taxes, about setting their salary correctly. And then in the final chapter, it's about building that financial safety net and then paying yourself when times are good and how to know how much to, to pay yourself. So 
what I try to do in the book is to kind of remove a lot of the noise around accounting jargon. So I tend not to use much of it in there. There's some simple to follow checklists with sort of how to set things up and some, some templates and things like that, but I try and keep it really to a minimum and it's specifically written to be neutral. So I'm not giving any specific tax advice around what you can deduct for expenses. It, it's not about that. It's about concepts. It's about managing your taxes. It's about setting yourself the right salary. And it's about creating an expense runway and having enough set aside to write out the bad times. So it's sort of boiled down to those three concepts. There's going to be an audio book version coming out next month too. Speak to my class about it. That's the way that they want to consume it in the headphones between shows or whatever. So that's coming out soon. But my real hope is that it kind of reduces the anxiety that paralyzes a lot of creators wherever they are in their career. The concepts in there are actually more specifically designed to those starting out. Anyway, it's out on Amazon. Get it from the Amazon US store. Congratulations on that, by the way. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> In my research, I found an older book that was targeted to the UK audience. Do you have any other books you want to shout out as well, or is it those two? That was my first book, The UK Music Artist, it's just a practical guide to starting a business. So that's UK focused. They're the only, only two books at the moment. But yeah, no, I'm excited for this one to come out. It's been a long time in the making. I actually wrote most of it during the pandemic. Yeah, a lot of ideas were inspired from that time, talking to people. A lot of people in some very stressful states, understandably, in that time. It kind of prompted me to create a solution and I was getting people that were coming to me that I couldn't serve in Iconic because we take on clients at a particular stage in their career, post signing a big record deal or something. That's when it makes sense to have a business manager, but there were still challenges for early stage artists, independent artists that perhaps had a CPA, but not a business manager, but they needed the support or some elements of support from a business manager. And that was kind of my inspiration to create something that provided infrastructure or support those artists and creators. I think that's wonderful for you to say, hey, this community is underserved. Here's what I can do. And you're adding value to that community. So first of all, just thank you for coming on the show to talk about this. Thank you for writing the book. I'm excited to read it. I know Matt and I were talking about it before the episode, and it sounds like Matt's going to read it too. Matt is in a band. I'm going to get on that audiobook for sure. I think there's so much to be gleaned from hearing an author's voice and tone and inflection. And I would go to a conference before uh, reading a book any day of the week, especially if it was like a reading from the author. There's so many subtle nuances and body language and things like that that get missed in text. So I'm definitely excited about the audiobook. That's right up my alley. <laughs> Great. I mean, I did read it myself. Excellent. I'm not the best at reading out loud, but that was kind of the feedback I was getting from my clients as well. They want to listen to stuff. Well, it's really nice to be able to put it on inside of the van while you're traveling. And it's like all your bandmates have to listen to it. So it's like whether or not you guys want to be on the same page, like we're having a financial planning meeting and everybody give me all of your noise canceling headphones, you know? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, Stephen, thank you again. Just one last question for you is where should people go to learn more about you? So I'm on Instagram, stephen.hell, LinkedIn, just type in Stephen Powell. Website is iconic.com, so that's iconac.com. All right, wonderful. And just to point out, that is Stephen with a P-H, not Stephen with a V. So S-T-E-P-H-E-N dot Pell, P-E-L-L on Instagram. Thank you again, Stephen, for joining us. I'm really glad you're here, and I hope you have an amazing holiday season. And to those of you who are listening... Merry Christmas retroactively and Happy New Year in a few days. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.